Good evening and welcome to everyone tuning in tonight. I'm your host, Andrew DeBlock, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. However, this is not just another episode tonight. For tonight, we celebrate our 50th iteration of Conservation Conversations. Uh, what started as a way for us to connect with our bird clubs during the national lockdown has grown into a very successful and well-supported enterprise with an audience of over 500 people tuning in every Tuesday evening to hear about birds, birding, and bird conservation. We as BirdLife South Africa are very proud of this initiative, and it is our privilege to bring you quality speakers and presentations week in and week out, but we could not do it without your support. Thank you to the stalwarts who have scratched Tuesdays out of their diary for over a year now, and a special thanks to those of you who have opted to donate to these webinars. We do incur costs to produce these webinars, so we're extremely grateful to those of you who make it possible for us to keep them going, free for all to learn and enjoy. Lastly, a very special thank you to the person that has driven this since day one, Dr. Melissa Whitecross. Melissa is one of the most organized, efficient, and all around incredible people I've ever come across. And despite her considerable workload as manager of the Landscape Conservation Program, she has worked consistently to keep these webinars running. Melissa, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for all the effort you've put into making conservation conversations such a success. I can assure you that if we were at a live event right now, you would be getting a rowdy applause and a standing ovation. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa. So on to tonight's episode, which is a continuation of our series on birding in sandbox destinations. Dr. Daniel Dankwitz, a resident in the Eastern Cape for over 15 years and a graduate of Rhodes University, is a professional tour leader for rock jumper birding tours. He's traveled uh, the world leading groups, but tonight he returns to his local patch to take us through what diverse riches Greater Addo National Park has to offer. Before we hear from Daniel, I need to let you know that you can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room and questions for our speakers can be asked posted into the Q&A box throughout the webinar. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can also use the common feed for your comments and questions. Our speaker will answer these questions at the end of the webinar. You can use the hashtag conservation conversations on all social media channels to let us know how you are tuning in and catch up. And you can catch up on any of our previous episodes via the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel and our podcast. If you've not done so yet, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel to help us grow support for our webinar content. Now, those of you who tuned in during April will know that we ran a competition to win the incredible Ultimate Companion for Birding in Southern Africa, written by Peter Jin and Jeff McLevin. To stand a chance of winning, all you needed to do was to donate a minimum of 100 rand through our Quicket platform throughout the month. We are excited to announce that the winner of the competition is Dai Jago. And Di, I hope I haven't butchered that pronunciation too much. Congratulations to you, Di, and thank you to everyone who donated during April. As I said, your donations keep these webinars free for all of us to learn and enjoy. But now don't be despondent if you didn't win this book, because you have yet another chance to win again tonight. Our friends at Straight Nature Publishers heard that we were featuring Addo and have offered two free copies to our audience this evening of their new release called Shaping Addo, authored by Mitch Reardon. They have also made a special discounted offer available for those of you who would like to purchase a copy this evening. If you order through the link on screen now, uh, you can make uh, use of this discounted offer. I'll also post this link in the chat box once Daniel has kicked off his presentation. Like Shaping Kruger, its successful predecessor, Shaping Addo delves into the history of the park, detailing the positive impact that changing conservation practices have had on its development. Drawing on decades of groundbreaking research, the author provides fascinating insight into the lives and habits of the animals, both terrestrial and marine, examining individual species, the relationship between them, and the carefully crafted management strategies required to ensure the survival of all species. Shaping Addo is an engrossing account of how a seemingly insignificant sanctuary was transformed into an astonishingly successful mega park and the most ecologically diverse protected space in South Africa. To win one of the two copies tonight, you need to pose a question to our speaker. Daniel has been tasked with picking his two favorite questions at the end of the Q&A session, and we will then get in contact with you. 
Unfortunately, we can only consider entrants from South Africa. So to that end, we do ask that you include your hometown as well as your email address in the question if you wish to be included in the competition. We also ask that you please keep your entries down to one question per person to prevent uh, Dan and I having to go through too many entries. In the case of you wanting to ask more than one question, you are welcome to, but we will only consider your first entry. And also do not worry about posting your contact details uh, in the question. We've set the Q&A box tonight to show only to Daniel and I to protect your private information. Now onto some of our upcoming events. BirdLife South Africa's fifth virtual Learn About Birds or Lab conference will run on the 27th and 28th of this month through the Zoom platform. Registrations can be carried out through the BirdLife South Africa website. The program for the event is now available on the dedicated lab webpage. Uh, so to find out more and to register for this event, please do visit that BirdLife South Africa website or you can email lab2021 at birdlife.org.za. Now our 2021 AGM is also going virtual again this year and will be held on the 29th of May after the lab conference. At the AGM, we will, we will be presenting the Gill Memorial uh, Medal to one of South Africa's top ornithologists, as well as making one or two surprise announcements alongside the regular agenda and the annual report. To register for this important event, please visit the Flock page under the events tab on our website, or you can email flock2021 at birdlife.org.za. Now we're also thrilled to announce that the Lab Canon Photography Workshop will be taking place after BirdLife South Africa's AGM on the Saturday 29th of May. This two hour workshop hosted by Canon South Africa and presented by nature and wildlife photographer Andrew Avery will showcase tips and tricks for improving your wildlife photography. The link to register will be available in the chat room after this or on the lab webpage. Tickets are 250 Rand per person and attendees who also join the lab conference will qualify for the lucky draw to win a Canon sponsored prize. For more info, you can email lab2021 at birdlife.org.za. So you will notice a strong virtual theme of BirdLife South Africa as we navigate the continued COVID-19 impacted world. And we're excited to announce that our virtual African bird fair is making a return to your screens. And this year is set to take place on 30 and 31 July, 2021. Be sure to watch BirdLife South Africa's media channels to find out more. Now, on to tonight's main course. Having spent more than half of his life exploring the remote corners of the Eastern Cape in pursuit of birds, there's perhaps no one better to guide us through the untouched riches of one of South Africa's least explored provinces than Dr. Daniel Danklitz. Dan grew up in Southern Zambia, where from a very young age, he gained a strong appreciation for all things wild. From the age of nine, Dan was already an enthusiastic birder. And at the age of 10, Dan moved to the Eastern Cape to attend boarding school at Kingswood College in Grahamstown, which is now called Wakanda. And Dan is an old St. Andrews boy, I won't hold that against you. This move presented him with a smorgasbord of new potential lifers and opportunities to travel. Weekends were spent exploring the remote corners of the province, always in hot pursuit of the next lifer. This childhood passion ignited a spark that later led him to pursue an academic career based at Rhodes University. His research focused on the genetic structure of tropical seabird populations and the implications of genetic population structure on species conservation requirements. After completing his doctorate in collaboration with Université de la Réunion, Dan left the Eastern Cape to become a permanent tour leader for rock jumper birding tours. He has since traveled extensively through more than 12 countries throughout Africa and Asia in pursuit of his feathered friends. However, Dan will openly admit that a large part of his heart is firmly rooted in the Eastern Cape and he'll take any opportunity to sneak back between his tours. Focusing on the, great Addo, the Greater Addo National Park tonight, South Africa's fourth largest national park, Dan will guide us through the incredible diversity of one of South Africa's top birding routes. This episode will feature creatures big and small, feathered and otherwise, and shall leave you itching to plan your next safari adventure. Dan, I'm going to hand over the floor. You can uh, unmute yourself, put your video on and say uh, good evening to everyone tonight. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in this evening. I am just quickly going to uh, navigate trying to share my screen. 
think Andrew's going to have to stop sharing his screen before I can start sharing mine. There you go. Uh, sorry, just take just a second. There we go. It should come through shortly. There we go. There we go. Good Thanks. evening, everyone, and thank you very much for tuning in this evening. I must say I'm quite honoured to be invited, to have been invited to uh, present to you on this, the 50th episode of Conservation Conversations. Tonight, we're going to continue in the exploration of South Africa's national parks, talking about a park that I have spent probably admittedly too much time in, but that is the Greater Addo Elephant National Park. Now I've termed my talk, or I've titled my talk this evening, Addo and the Unexplored Riches of the Eastern Cape, South Africa, in that I firmly believe that the Eastern Cape is uh, without a doubt one of South Africa's least appreciated provinces in terms of its burning potential. And within the last 10 years or so, the Eastern Cape has gained immense traction as one of the best uh, provinces in South Africa to target several of our most sought after and challenging species. But to not waste any time, let's jump straight into the talk this evening, beginning with a brief history of Addo Elephant National Park. Now, unfortunately, the history of Addo is a fairly dark and bloody one. Addo was proclaimed in the year 1931 to protect just 11 remaining elephants within the greater Addo region of the Eastern Cape. This region of the Eastern Cape was colonized in the year 1740 and by the 1750s, ivory trading within the Eastern Cape was absolutely rife, placing immense pressure on the elephant population. By the 1900s, elephants had retreated into the remotest corners of the Greater Addo region, and coupled with the immense hunting pressure that they were facing, the elephants were also seen as vermin by the local farming community that had developed over the same period. Now, the conflict between the local farmers, the Sundays River, which flows through the Greater Addo region, is one of the top citrus growing areas anywhere in South Africa. And elephants obviously love citrus. So the conflict that resulted between the elephants and the local farmers reached a head in about the year 1919. And a major Pretorius was brought in to quite literally exterminate the vermin elephant from the Greater Addo uh, region. A total of 114 elephants were shot out of the region between the years 1919 and 1920, leaving a single herd of just 11 individuals. Now, in the decades that followed, public opinion changed quite dramatically, and Addo was proclaimed as a national park in the year 1931. Now, the original area was just 2,000 hectares or 20 kilometers squared, and that was home to just 11 individual elephants, which you can see in the top image on the slide. Now, without adequate fencing, the elephants would regularly escape from the national park, and the conflict between the elephants and the farming communities continued for several years. This was until in the year 1954, Graham Armstrong, who you can see in the lower two images on this uh, slide, was brought in as the head of Addo Elephant National Park. Now, he set out to, uh, to build a fence to surround the national park, which at that time had then increased from 2,000 hectares to just 2,200 hectares. The elephant population had also doubled in the period to just 20 individuals. 
Now, this in, uh, initial fence was built using tram, uh, tram lines, which you can see in the images at the bottom of the slide, as well as lift cables. And interestingly enough, this original fence is still in use today. Now, over the years that have followed, Addo Elephant National Park has been expanded dramatically, and currently it's the fourth largest national park in South Africa, encompassing 11 main sections. There are three sections which are accessible to the general public, and those are the three sections I'll be focusing on today. The core elephant reserve, the Woody Cape and Alexandria dune field section, and the Addo Island Reserve. Now, Addo, as it stands today, covers an area of 172,000 hectares. In this image, Addo is the area encompassed in that uh, green polygon. Addo itself is situated about 70 kilometers northeast of the city of Tebeja, previously Port Elizabeth, extending northwards from the small town of Colchester up into the Zierberg Mountains. As part of the Addo expansion program, the Alexandria June, uh, Alexandria June Fields and the Woody Cape Forest were included in a coastal section, as well as a large marine protected area, which encompasses both the St. Croix and Bird Island Island groups. Now, the efforts to expand Addo Elephant National Park are continuing. And the areas of the map that are highlighted here in orange have been earmarked as areas that uh, hopefully within the next decade or so will be included into, national, into the national park, making it the third largest national park in South Africa and the most biodiverse national park in all of South Africa. Interestingly, the national park uh, protects 13 key vegetation types, which is far higher than any other national park in South Africa, and that extends into the rest of its biodiversity in terms of the invertebrate communities, the birds, the mammals, and everything else that occur. To have a quick look at the core section of Addo Elephant National Park, the core section is distributed immediately north of the small town of Colchester, roughly 70 kilometers northeast of Kebeja or Port Elizabeth. It runs up until the R335, which connects the small villages of Addo and Patterson. And the main Addo rest camp is situated just about a kilometer off this main R335. There's an incredibly detailed network of roads that travel through the park, um, several interesting waterholes, um, the, the roads through the national park are both tarred in some sections as well as gravel uh, through the rest. I think in this map, the tarred sections are in red and the gravel sections are in yellow. But all of these roads are easily traversable in even sedan type vehicles. So it's an incredibly accessible and wonderful park to visit. Further to the east of that, just south of a small village by the name of Alexandria, is the Woody Cape section, encompassing the, uh, the Woody Cape Forest, as well as the Alexandria June Fields. And just off the coast from there is the Algoa Bay Marine Protected Area, which encompasses several islands that are important breeding sites for, um, for seabirds, among other interesting animals. Now, in terms of its overall biodiversity, Addo is unique in that it is the only reserve in the world to be listed as a big seven reserve. Now, everyone obviously knows who the big five are, the lion, leopard, buffalo, rhino, and elephant. But this uh, term, which dates back to an in initial hunting reference, has been expanded with the inclusion of the marine protected area to include both the southern right whale and the great white shark, making it the big seven. In terms of birds, the total species list at the moment stands as four, at 417 bird species. And this includes an incredible five endemic species to South Africa, 
20 regional endemics, sorry, 12 of the 20 regional endemics. Now the regional endemics are species that are only shared with Lesotho and Swaziland, and then 20 of the 30 near endemics. So those are species that have 70% or more distribution within South Africa. Before you go, um, it's important to note that uh, Addo Elephant National Park is listed as a national park, so it's sand parks managed. Gate times and distances, well gate times vary seasonally, but generally you're looking at entrance at about seven o'clock in the morning and the gates close at either half past six or seven o'clock in the evening. So you can virtually get a full 12 hours within the reserve. It's one of the most accessible national parks uh, in all of South Africa. And depending on which way you travel, it can be anything between about 70 kilometers or 90 kilometers to get to the main Addo rest camp. In terms of the Woody Cape section, that is a little bit further uh, to the east and it's situated about 120 kilometers from Tebeja or Port Elizabeth. There's various different accommodation options throughout the reserve, and this includes camping, some self-catering options, and then there's some more luxurious op options in the neighboring private reserves, as well as in several of the private concessions that are included into Addo Elephant National Park. And just to show you some of the pictures of the accommodation, this is the main Addo Rest Camp, which is um, built in an incredible Cape Dutch style. Just in front of the chalets, you'll note the original Anderson fence um, and the elephants are frequently seen at water holes just in front of the chalets. So it's an absolutely wonderful place to stay. The main, main camp is outside of the main reserve, so it is permissible to walk around through the vegetation there. And in fact, in terms of the birding that you'll be doing within Addo, this is one of the best places to, uh, to start before you venture further. There are some more luxurious options. This particular image is of the Gora Elephant, uh, Elephant Lodge, which is in a private concession within the south of Addo, and it offers five-star accommodation and uh, five-star dining. So really quite luxurious and a wonderful place to stay. The private concessions are also off limits to the general public, meaning that you also get a very private safari experience. Out in the Woody Cape section, it is possible to camp, but these are the Langebos huts, which are a self-catering uh, option uh, situated right in the middle of the Woody Cape forest. And in fact, the gardens of the Langebos huts one of the best places to look for certain species like African wood owl, buff spotted flufftail, and chorister robin chat. In terms of birder friendly accommodation, uh, this is managed by BirdLife South Africa, of course. Riverbend Lodge, which is in the uh, Nyati section of Addo Elephant National Park, just to the north of the R335 is a bird friendly establishment. It is also quite luxurious, five star, uh, but a very, very nice place to stay. Something I would just like to highlight in terms of before I get into the things that you can see in Addo is the Addo Education Center situated at the main rest camp. Um, there are also a number of restaurants and things here but the, um, the education center really is a place worth uh, visiting. Too often people just sort of try and rush to get into the park, but this education center has a lot of extremely valuable information about the history of Addo, the evolution of elephants, um, but also interestingly, the indigenous culture to this uh, region of the Eastern Cape, which is uh, quite interesting to read about. I also would like to draw attention to the elephant head at the, uh, that's mounted against the wall at the back of this image. That head is the original head of an elephant by the name of Harpur. And you'll note a lot of the waterholes and the different loops within Addo 
have been named after Harpur or some of his descendants. This is an absolutely legendary elephant bull. Uh, he was the dominant bull in the park for over 20 years before he was eventually killed by one of his subordinates. And finally, in terms of the various activities that you can do in Addo, through sand parks, there are a number of options, including night drives, game walks, guided game drives, elephant encounters, and when staying in Tebeja, it's possible to do both whale and penguin watching. And what to expect from the activities? Well, it is sand park, so it will be very much the same as what you'll get in any of the other national parks. Um, very comfortable game viewing vehicles. The local guides are very well trained on where and how to find the different animals. But I would just mention if you are planning a trip to Addo to just mention to the guides that you are, if you are interested in birds and they are very good at then pointing out some of the bird life that can be seen within Addo. One of the best things I've ever done in my entire life is the Addo horse trails where they take you on horseback through one of the private concessions of the reserve and you get the opportunity to approach totally wild elephants and other game on horseback, which really is an absolutely incredible way to, uh, to go about game viewing. Then on to what you can see in Addo. Well, a lot of the vegetation in Addo is dominated by the Albany thicket, which is unique to this part of the Eastern Cape. Um, but within the uh, National Park, there are 13 different vegetation types split across four of the dominant biomes. So within the main sections of the reserve, you'll encounter elements of Fainbos, Albany thicket, Namakaru, and forest. You'll notice some grasslands down in the bottom of this image, right down in the base of the valleys. This is an incredibly unnatural habitat to the area. And part of the mission of Addo Elephant National Park is to try and take in some of the surrounding farming communities and to uh, restore the habitat within these areas back to the indigenous uh, habitat of the uh, Sundays River Valley. Two interesting plant species to look for when visiting Addo. First on the left is speckworm. For the overseas vid visitors, speckworm means a bacon tree. And this uh, describes its succulent, slightly leathery leaves. Now, interestingly enough, this is the species of plant that has the highest carbon sequestration of any plant species in the world meaning that the rate at which it draws carbon in out of the atmosphere is higher than any other tree in the world. And it's part of uh, ongoing efforts to combat climate change. On the right hand side is aloe ferox, which is a very iconic species of plant to the Eastern Cape. And together with the Addo elephants is the feature of the Eastern Cape number plate for your vehicles. Up in the Zierberg Mountains in the north of Addo, the habitat becomes quite a bit more undulating and a little bit uh, drier in places. And the uh, avian diversity is quite different in these, uh, in these parts of the park. Just some general scenery. Addo is one of the best places in the world to have close encounters with elephants. And while I absolutely wouldn't recommend anyone try and approach an elephant in a vehicle or otherwise, sometimes if you do just sit very quietly and watch a herd of elephants, they will approach you and in a completely non-threatening way, they will walk straight past your vehicle. And um, it's really quite incredible to, to get up close and personal with these magnificent creatures. Um, there's some wonderful water holes to go and sit at, and many of the game within Addo are water dependent. So the best place to, the best way to approach uh, seeing the animals is just to, to sit and wait at one of the water holes. And then on to the elephants. After Addo's fairly dark history, where the elephant population had virtually been exterminated, 
the population of elephants within Addo has increased now to about 450 individuals. So it's a very healthy population now. Um, you often see lots of young ones. Um, the herds have their typical social dynamics once again. Um, so it's always wonderful to spend time uh, just watching the elephants. But I do want to point out in several of these images, you'll notice that many of the elephants totally lack tusks. Now, this is an artifact of the intense hunting pressure that the Addo elephants once faced in that the tusked genes in this population have virtually been shot out. Uh, obviously, the tusked individuals were the first ones to get targeted when the elephants were facing that intense hunting pressure. And sand parks are working quite actively to try and restore the genetics of the Addo elephants by introducing some Kruger tuskets. Now in the lower right hand image, you'll see the dominant bull on the left has some fairly large tusks. He is one of several individual Kruger tuskers that have been introduced into the park in an effort to try and reintroduce the tusked genes. Like I said, the elephant population is increasing quite dramatically, and you'll see that many of the younger elephants, such as in the lower left-hand image here, are starting to show tusks. So these efforts the sand parks are taking are seemingly successful. And in terms of what else you can see, we'll just continue with the theme for mammals first, and then I'll introduce some of the birds. Addo is one of the best places in the country to get up close and personal with black-backed jackal. And although these, this uh, species has a fairly bad reputation in South Africa, I think it's an absolutely beautiful creature and it's so wonderful to get uh, to, to see them in a natural setting where they're completely unafraid of humans and um, you can really admire them. Addo is the big five reserve, so in addition to rhino, it is possible to see both Cape buffalo and African lion, but leopard is extremely difficult to see in Addo. So uh, if leopard is on your list, I don't think this is the park to try and find leopard, but in saying that hyena are quite common, and this is one of the few places where you can see both spotted and brown hyena. In terms of general plains game, warthog are very prevalent and you typically see them wallowing in the mud at some of the water holes. Uh, the Burchell's subspecies of plains zebra is quite common in the park, as is red hartebeest and common eland. But as was indicated in the brief chat at the beginning of the talk, Addo is one of the better places in the better national parks in South Africa to catch up with some very unusual animals. It's one of the few places that I personally have ever seen caracal. I know Andrew also said that his first caracal was in Addo. Rock hyrax are all over the place. Uh, there are several troops of meerkat that patrol those open plains. And like I said previously, it's one of the few places where you can also catch up with brown hyena. Some of the other animals you can expect, these typically on a night drive in the park, include bat-eared fox, honey badger, and if you're extremely lucky, an art fox. And then two species of tortoise are quite prevalent in the park, including the angulate as well as the leopard tortoise. Now to just diverge a little bit, there is an incredibly famous tortoise, uh, a leopard tortoise that once lived in Addo, known as Domkrach. And again, many of the water holes and the loops that you will drive are named after this particular individual tortoise. And his shell is also preserved within the education center. Now Domkrach had a very peculiar habit of crawling under vehicles and he's rumored to have such immense strength that he could quite literally pick up a vehicle. Whether or not that's true, I'm not certain, but the legend of Domkrach still persists. And in terms of the pole in the beginning, in terms of the unique road sign that you'll see in Addo, 
Addo is one of the last remaining strongholds of this interesting creature, and it's a flightless dung beetle of the genus Circelium. Now, this species was previously quite widespread throughout South Africa, but it's dependent on large herbivores for its breeding cycle. And so with the eradication of large herbivores or with the contraction of um, the range of large herbivores into national parks, so this dung beetle has become quite threatened. But Addo Elephant National Park is one of the best places in the country to see it. Uh, you actually can't miss it. And I must just highlight that dung beetles have right of way. So when driving through, uh, through Addo, Bear in mind that these little creatures can only scurry so fast and uh, give them the time they need to get off the road. Now on to the birds. I mentioned that Addo Elephant National Park has 417 species found within the boundaries of the 11 sections. And the species that you can see within Addo are quite characteristic of uh, the different biomes that we have. So the forest, the Albany thicket, the Nama Karoo, and Fainbos. This is one of the few places in the country where dark capped and cape bulbul co-occur. And one has to uh, be a bit cautious when looking at bulbuls in Addo in that these two species re regularly hybridize. The gorgeous Bokmakiri, which is a near endemic to South Africa, is one of the most iconic species in Addo. Uh, you regularly see them out calling in the early morning and late afternoon, but it's very difficult to miss the gorgeous Bokmakiri in Addo. Southern fiscal are quite common throughout, and in the drier grassland sections, it's possible to see anteating chat, karoo scrub robin, and capped wheatear, all also fairly common throughout the park. Mouse birds occur uh, in the Albany thicket. Uh, and in fact, all three species of mouse bird that we can see in South Africa, the white backed, speckled, and red faced mouse birds, are all possible within Addo. Now, for the overseas listeners, this is an endemic African family of birds. So, this is one that you may be interested in catching up with. Addo is a fantastic place to look out for your larger terrestrial species. Southern Black Koran, which is an endemic to South Africa, is very common throughout the park, but it's impossible to, uh, to drive away from one of these individuals, no matter how common the species is. It's always a bird that's good to stop and look at. South Africa's national bird, the blue crane, is fairly prevalent in the park, particularly at some of the waterholes. Uh, secretary bird breed within the park. And then it's one of the few places in, the, in South Africa where four species of busted co-occur. So within Addo, it's possible to see Ludwigs, Denhams, Cori, and the threatened white-bellied busted. So very, very good place to catch up with these large, large terrestrial species. There are num numerous wetlands and waterholes throughout the park. And while you're sitting there watching the elephants, keep your eyes peeled out for the Levalans cysticola, one of the most common LBJs in the park, but it's got a very beautiful song. And then I'd recommend visiting the bird hide near the main Addo rest camp as this is one of the best places to get lovely open views of African snipe, southern red bishop, red knobbed coot, and several other waterfowl species. Addo is also a wonderful place to catch up with birds of prey. Uh, Varose, Marshall, and crowned eagle all can be seen within the park. These are, of course, our three large eagles. Pale chanting goshawk is one of the most common birds in the park, and it is quite prevalent, uh, very easy to see. They have a tendency of always perching up on the tops of uh, shrubs or trees. And then peregrine falcon, 
as well as Lana Falcon, is prevalent throughout the park. And during the summer months, between about November and April, you could be very lucky and catch up with the Siberian race of peregrine falcon, as this is one of the most important win uh, wintering sites for the species. In terms of Addo's special birds, Addo is one of the best places in the country to see the notoriously difficult Neisner woodpecker and southern chagra. Now, a lot of birders in South Africa tend to struggle with these two species in particular, but I would even go so far as to say that both species are guaranteed in Addo, provided you know where to look, as well as uh, knowing what the birds sound like. Knowledge of the call is absolutely key to finding both the Neisner woodpecker and the southern chagra. The beautiful olive bush shrike is also possible and it's quite common throughout the park, but once again, it is important to know the song of the olive bush shrike as this is key to locating it. And interestingly enough, although the white-fronted bee eater is a very widespread species, its range has extended down the Sundays River, which travels or which flows along the western edge of Addo Elephant National Park, and several white-fronted bee-eater colonies can be seen there, this at the very southern extreme of the species' distribution. Now, moving on from Addo Elephant, the core elephant section of Addo Elephant National Park to the Woody Cape section of Addo Elephant National Park, this is in the east. This is a section that is free from any elephants, so it is possible to walk. And the habitat here is quite different with large tracts of mature, pristine, beautiful, almost Afro-Montane forest, but at very, very low altitude. This section of the park also preserves the Alexandria Dune Field, which extends from Kucha Harbour, which you can see in the very western edge of the photograph here, all the way to the small village of Cannon Rocks in the east. And just near the, on the right hand side of the image, you can see a large dark shape in the landscape there. That's the uh, woody cape section of the forest that I was talking about moments ago. But the Alexandria dune field is the most pristine and extensive dune field anywhere in the southern hemisphere. Uh, covering an area of about 15,800 hectares, amounting to about 375,000 cubic tons of sand, and it extends 80 kilometers in length and five kilometers wide at its widest point. While I'm here, I'll also just highlight that those two dark smudges that you can see in the sea there are the um, Algoa Bay Island Reserve with St. Croix in the west and Bird Island in the east, but I'll talk to you about those in a moment's time. The Alexandria Dune Field, uh, sorry, the Alexandria Forest and the Woody Cape is perhaps one of the best places in Addo to search for the Neisner woodpecker. Again, once again, it's uh, important to know the species' call. Um, but other forest species to look out for include the diminutive Cape Battis, surely one of our most beautiful uh, birds in South Africa, very cute and with lots of character. And then the shy blue mantled crested flycatcher, which never sits still, and the Narina trogon are all possibilities. The endemic a uh, Neisner warbler and the near endemic Barrett's warbler can be seen within the forest. Neither of these species are particularly easy to catch up with, just in that they're extremely shy and reclusive. But uh, with knowledge of their call and a bit of patience, it is certainly possible to find both species on a single visit to, to the park. Other birds to look out for include the Neisner Taraco, once again, an endemic African family for the overseas listeners, as well as brown scrub robin, white starred robin, and then chorister robin chat also occurs quite commonly. 
a number of other birds of prey occur. I mentioned earlier in the talk that the uh, woody cape forests, particularly around the Langebors huts, are a fantastic place to look for the African wood owl. Other species include the crowned eagle, forest buzzard, and then an assortment of occipiters, this one here, the rufous-chested or rufous-breasted sparrowhawk. Now just to uh, highlight one of the other birds that can be found within the area, this is the African barred owlet, but it's an extremely special uh, subspecies of the African barred owlet, the nominate race of African barred owlet. Um, there is currently a study being done at Rhodes University, the uh, head researcher is Joe Balmer, um, that's looking to assess the genetic relationships of these birds, the uh, nominate race of African barred owlet, and it is quite likely that these birds will be genetically distinct enough to warrant species status, and if so, the birds will then become endemic to the greater Addo region. The Woody Cape forests are then a fantastic space, a uh, fantastic place to look for a number of forest mammals. Uh, these are normally quite shy and difficult to see, but they occur quite commonly throughout the park and evidence of them is uh, incredibly easy to find. Uh, these are the blue dica, one of our smallest antelope species in all of Africa, the tree hyrax, bush pig, and then bush buck. And lastly, I'm going to talk to you briefly through the Algoa Bay Island Reserve. Now, Algoa Bay, which you can see in uh, the lower quadrant of this slide, is a fairly large bay, but it has a number of small islands distributed uh, throughout it. Near the Kucha Harbour, so up in the top left panel, is St. Croix, which is a large rock, rock stack that stands a few meters above the sea and is an important, until recently, one of the most important breeding colonies of African penguin. And then in the east, there is the Bird Island Group. So Bird Island, the Bird Island Group consists of Bird Island, the largest island in the group, Stag Island, Seal Island, and then Black Rocks. Bird Island is the largest island in Algoa Bay, and I, it has an active research center on it. Unfortunately, it isn't possible to visit Bird Island, but it, um, I will show it to you just for um, completeness. Um, it has a large lighthouse in the southeast of the island. And if you uh, notice the uh, large gray smudge across the center of this uh, satellite image of the island, this is the largest gannetry in the world amounting to between 60 and 80,000 pairs of Cape gannets. So it's really an important breeding site for the species in a global sense um, and an important seabird breeding colony just in general. Have to just say after the time that I spent working on Bird Island, the stench of ammonia and the sound of gannets coming into the breeding colony really is something to behold and uh, something of a feast for the senses when you're trying to sleep late at night. The rest of um, Bird Island is covered in some fairly low herbaceous vegetation and this is an important uh, breeding site for the endemic or near endemic African penguin. Now, both Bird Island and St. Croix each hold about 2,000 uh, pairs of the uh, African penguin, but the populations of African penguins are in sharp decline. Other species that can be seen on these uh, islands include Cape Cormorants. The Algo Bay Islands are listed as an important bird area given the uh, numbers of Cape Gannets, African Penguins, and Cape Cormorants that breed there. But the island also supports South Africa's largest breeding colony of rosette terns. 
This is a work, a bird that I've worked extensively on, and it really is one of our most beautiful birds in South Africa. So about 200 pairs of rosa tern come to breed each spring on the on Bird Island. Kelp gull is also prevalent, um, with several hundred pairs visiting the island at times. Uh, the Alexandria June fields are an important breeding site of Damara terns, holding 20% of South Africa's breeding population of, uh, of these birds. So the Woody Cape is also listed as an important bird area given the numbers of Damara tern. These islands are an important wintering spot for several waders, including the ruddy turnstone. And then the Algoa Bay in general is a very important foraging site for several pelagic species, including several albatrosses, petrels, and shearwaters. Other iconic birds include the African oyster catcher. This area holds about 2% of the national population of African oyster catcher. So another reason for it to be listed as an important bird area. Antarctic tern is a seasonally visiting bird. They arrive here between about April and they depart in September. And Bird Island itself holds up to 40% of the African non-breeding population of Antarctic terns. So that's really quite incredible to see. Several hundred individual birds coming in to roost each evening. On Bird Island, it is also possible to see Australasian gannet pictured here. This is a bird I found a couple of years back on Bird Island, but one does have to look through about 80,000 individual birds before you're lucky enough to pick out an Australasian. So it does take time and effort. And then perhaps sometime in the future, Bird Island will be South Africa's only breeding site for sooty tern. I've personally watched birds mating and uh, going through nesting rituals on Bird Island. So it is possible that this bird will join, or these, the species will join the rosette tern and one day nest on Bird Island. The Algoa Bay is then a fantastic spot for marine mammals, and it is possible to arrange both shark uh, viewing opportunities as well as uh, whale watching and seal watching within Algoa Bay. But Algoa Bay supports incredible populations of up to about four or five species of dolphin, um, a large resident population of great white sharks, which is supported by the uh, South African fur seal population. And then it's an important, important wintering ground for southern right and a few other whale species. And finally, just to end my talk on something of a somber note, um, the African penguin population is in rapid, rapid decline. And until recently, the Algoa Bay population, which is the easternmost, uh, pop uh, easternmost population of African penguins, has uh, also undergone some fairly significant declines. Now, these photos in, taken on Dyer Island about 100 years apart show just quite the extent to which African population, African penguin populations have declined. And if you would like to know more about that, if you missed the talk from last week, I would uh, really encourage you to go onto YouTube or the BirdLife Facebook channel and just catch up with some of the seabird researchers affiliated with BirdLife and the incredible work that they are doing to try and save South Africa's most endearing near endemic. And that's all from me. I'd just like to briefly thank some of the uh, individuals that allowed me to uh, use their photographs. And on that note, I will hand over to Andrew again. Is Andrew there? I'm here. Thank you, Dan. And uh, we really, really appreciate you coming on tonight and giving us that very thorough uh, overview of, of this, this wonderful national park that we have on our doorstep. 
I think your your passion for the Eastern Cape and for its fauna and flora really shone through. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. I think many of us before we next visit at our national park will be coming back to this webinar as a trip planning tool. I think you shared you shared many, many uh, useful tips uh, for, for visitors up the front and a, a wonderful, as I said, overview of the different species, both both feathered and unfeathered that, that one can encounter uh, across all the different sections of the park. So, so thank you, Dan. Um, you've been a credit to yourself and to Rock Down the Birding Tours, and we're very glad to have had you on for our 50th episode. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for inviting me to partake. Wonderful. All right, everyone, if you do have a question for Dan, you can put these in the Zoom Q&A box or in the Facebook Live comments. Uh, remember, if you would like your question to be considered as part of the Strake Nature competition to win a copy of uh, Shaping Addo by Mitch Redden, you need to include your hometown as proof of your SA residency as well as your email address. Unfortunately, we are only going to be considering questions on Zoom for this. Um, we don't want people posting their email addresses and hometowns on Facebook if we can help it. Um, so please don't do that. Um, we'll get to the questions in just a second. I see there's, there's already quite a few for us there, Dan. You can start looking through and trying to judge which might be one of the contenders for your favorites. But I would like to remind everyone that the post-webinar survey will pop up when we leave the webinar tonight. Please do just take a minute um, to answer the questions there. Um, they relate to tonight's webinars and also the continuation of these webinars and which kind of content that uh, you, our, our audience, would like to see. And uh, yeah, please just do take a minute to, to look at those. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Gabriel Jamie. I uh, incorrectly last week announced that he was the coming week, but in fact, of course, it was Dan this week, not Gabriel. Um, Gabriel is going to be talking on brood parasitism and the, uh, the taking a deep dive into a world full of uh, trickery, illusion, arms races, and life or death situations. So it promises to be uh, quite an exciting one. I know that Gabriel is a very knowledgeable and uh, a very eloquent speaker, so I think you'll enjoy uh, next week's webinar as much as you did, no doubt, enjoy Dan's webinar tonight. Um, a reminder that if you are not one of the two lucky people tonight who does win a copy of Shaping Addo, you are able to make use of the heavily discounted offer through the link in the chat box, and I will post that again in just a second. Um, this book, which usually costs 320 Rand, is available for only 256 Rand and delivery within SA is free. So thank you to our very valued partners at Straight Nature Publishing who've made this special offer available just for this webinar to celebrate the wonderful diverse riches of Addo National Park. So if you do want to know some more, um, dig a bit deeper into some of the items that uh, Dan touched on, then uh, do go ahead and get this book. It's very well researched and I know uh, Mitch is a very decorated author and so you will enjoy it. All right, Dan, we're going to get stuck into some of those questions now. I'm just going to bring them Sounds up. Sounds great. And I'm, I'm, I'm frankly a little lost as where to start. Usually we have, um, you know, just a couple of questions to get through, but of course tonight people have been incentivized. So people are very, very curious about um, the things going on. The... I'm, go I'm going to pick out questions that uh, I think are relevant to, to lots of people in the audience. You're welcome to uh, read through them and pick questions uh, yourself as well, if there's anything that stands out. Um, I'm just going to pick out one here. So I'm going to be a little bit uh, of an nepotist and um, ask a question that my mom has posted in the chat in the Q&A to pick us off. Um, my mom, her name is Lynn, she'd like to know what are the typical predators for birds in Addo? Uh, she obviously knows raptors, some raptors prey on birds, but what else is a danger to the birds? Uh, perhaps caracals? Uh, indeed, caracal will prey quite uh, readily on, uh, on birds. I would also say some of the other smaller uh, carnivores that you could expect to see in, um, in Addo, things like black-backed jackal, bat-eared fox, quite opportunistically, if they find nesting birds, they will uh, they will take them, but certainly there's a very high abundance of birds of prey, things like rock kestrels, pale chanting goshawks, your larger eagles. Um, so 
the eagles, uh, the birds of prey certainly, and then your smaller, uh, smaller carnivorous mammals. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I've got a question here from, from Alan Samuels, which is also echoed by Penny Abbott. Um, Alan, Alan would like to know what is the best way to visit the Woody Cape Forest section uh, by vehicle on foot or by a guided trip? Uh, he's never been there, but he's keen to do this later this year. And also, how long a visit would you suggest? I would certainly uh, advise uh, either an overnight or a two-night stay in uh, the Alexandria Forest, the Woody Cape section. Uh, the Langebos uh, huts, which I showed earlier in one of my slides, are a fantastic place to stay right in the heart of the forest. And although it is possible to drive to the Langebos huts, there's various trails that lead into the forest from there that you can do at a leisurely place. Uh, they are all incredibly well marked and it's a lovely place just to meander and sitting and quietly watching you will uh, almost certainly come away with a very impressive list of uh, forest bird species as well as perhaps some of those mammals that I showed. Great, thanks for sharing. Uh, there's a couple of people in the, in the question section who'd like to know a bit more about um, the arid section that you didn't include. Is there, is there access to this at all? Do you know anything about it? So the Nyati section in the north of Addo up in the Zioberg Mountains is part of a private concession. So uh, several of the activities that you can arrange from the main uh, Addo camp uh, happen within that Nyati section, but they are all guided. It's not possible to visit it alone. Um, it is then possible to stay, I showed the Riverbend Lodge, which is the birder friendly um, establishment within the Greater Addo region. That is within the Nyati section and the local guides that work through the lodge will, uh, I'm sure, gladly take you out through, through that section and they can show you, um, but it's unfortunately not open to the general public. All right, thank you for that. Uh, there's a, a quick question here from Ted van der Meulen that I think people might be interested in. Uh, he'd like to know, how did you tell the Australasian gannet apart from the Cape gannet? Obviously that, that photograph was, uh, it looks very much like a Cape gannet. So what's the difference? It is tricky, um, but you are reliant on a few different features. So the gannets have what is known as a gular stripe which is a stripe of bare skin extending from the base of the beak down the neck. And in Cape Gannet, the gular stripe is long, extending sort of halfway down the neck. And in Australasian Gannet, the gular stripe is short and it extends little past the base of the bill. In addition to that, where Cape Gannets tend to have a black tail uh, with variable amounts of white in it. Australasian gannet always has the iconic four white outer tail feathers on each side of the tail with four black central tail feathers. The call is also somewhat more high pitched than the Cape gannet. And lastly, the yellow on the back of the head of the Cape gannet is not quite as extensive in Australasian uh, than it is in Cape. Uh, so it's a combination of features, but neither of them or none of them are all that obvious. Okay, yeah, certainly a tricky one to pick out. And I think the only two spots I know of are Bird Island and Malkos Island off the West Coast um, that have had, you know, historic records. Um, and it, as you say, it's, it's picking out, if you're on Bird Island in particular, it's picking out one out of 80,000 birds. It's, <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do. Absolutely. And there are a number of hybrids. The two species are known to hybridize. So that just complicates matters further that the hybrids tend to show intermediate plumage between the two species. So um, you do have to rely on all of the features together to separate those two very similar birds. Great, thank you, Dan. So there's been a couple of questions on the subject of vultures. I'm gonna pick up Owen Vensels. Owen uh, wants to know, do you think that more vultures will now appear and stay in the Addo region now that a white-backed vulture has been in Addo for the last few days? So I, I pick up from the comments that there's 
there's a vagrant uh, whiteback vulture there and, and people are asking, you know, will we start to see other vultures now? Um, certainly, the whiteback vulture is very much a vagrant to the Eastern Cape. It isn't the first vulture uh, to turn up in Addo, um, but the species that we uh, see a lot more of in the Eastern Cape is the Cape vulture. Now, the nearest breeding colonies of Cape vulture, as far as I'm aware, are quite near uh, Bedford and Craddock which is probably 200 kilometers or 150 kilometers further east than Addo. So certainly well within the uh, foraging range of the birds. And I think eventually perhaps they will become more regular, but for a long time still, I think a vulture with an Addo would be quite a special sighting, no matter what species it is. Interesting. I would I would think with the um, the return of large predators to the area that can open up carcasses for vultures, there there may be an unfilled niche there. But as you say, it's about birds actually finding the area and starting to colonize it again. Um, I assume that there may have been vultures there in the past before the extermination of those those vermin species. To 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 use um, the air quotes, um, of course, elephants and large predators are not vermin um, as much as uh, historic park management might have thought so, uh, you know, within the last hundred years. Uh, Harriet Nimmo has a question which I think is a pertinent one, but perhaps you don't have a clear answer to not, not being um, personally engaged with the park. She wants to know how are Addo engaging with and inspiring the next generation of birders and conservationists in the local communities around Addo? So of course, the Eastern Cape is one of our most impoverished provinces. And uh, there are some communities around the Addo National Park. Do you know of any uh, community engagement plans going on there? I know that Addo, I don't know all of the specific details. I have to be honest of that. But I know Addo and sand parks in general do work extensively with the, within the local communities to not only educate them, but empower them. So... Um, the expansion of Addo Elephant National Park now to include all of those uh, surrounding areas has come with immense uh, employment of people from the surrounding communities, uh, providing jobs and education and everything uh, like that. Um, I don't know of any specific in, uh, programs that they have in place, but I do know that they work extensively within those local communities to, uh, to empower them. Thanks for sharing. I'm, I'm sure they can get in touch with Sandbox if they have any more specific questions around that. Um, Mervyn Whitmore has a question and someone asked uh, an ally question uh, down below. I'll try to bring up their name while you're answering, answering them. Mervyn would like to know, uh, are the Addo elephants generally more docile than in other parks? Because he's he's never personally heard of any incidents in Addo with regards to aggressive elephants, whereas obviously these stories do exist in some of the other parks like Pilansburg, Kruger National Park, um, etc. So, so do you know, are there behavioral uh, changes in the Addo population? And then I know the, the other question I'll go and find, it, as I said, was whether the genetics of the elephants might be affecting their nature and making them more docile? Uh, so I certainly don't think that the, uh, the genetic depletion of the Addo elephant population has had too much of an effect on uh, their behavioral responses to, uh, to humans. But in saying that, the, uh, the elephants are very much uh, or are very docile within Addo. How that compares to Kruger, I mean, uh, my experiences in Kruger, I've never been charged by an elephant or things like that. Obviously, if you come across a stroppy elephant on must, then you, uh, you do need to give it a little bit of uh, a wider berth. Um, but generally, um, the, the adult elephants are very docile and typically don't uh, cause havoc. Um, I don't think elephants in general, I think they're very misunderstood creatures in terms of their, um, their strength and these incidents that certainly 
do happen in some of the other reserves. Uh, but yeah, I've, the, the Addo elephants are particularly docile, I would think. I also remember on previous visits to the park, if you park off next to that top dam, dam um, and you have these huge elephant herds coming down to drink, uh, you can park off there, turn off your engine and, and the elephant herds will come literally right past your car. So they, they are quite, quite used to people, I think, around certain areas of Addo. And that makes for incredible viewing and photographic opportunities, of course. Um, but I think the, the key is to, to rather uh, give them some distance, park off, and let them come into your space rather than you going into their space. I think that's, that's when they start to feel threatened. Absolutely. So just, just bearing in mind their behavior and being able to read their behavior and seeing their uh, elephants. I did notice one, um, there was one comment on the communication of elephants, which I um, flagged as how vocal are they and how many different sounds that they make. Elephants are incredibly vocal, incredibly social creatures. So uh, simply just reading that behavior, it's very easy to do. You can quite quickly get an impression on uh, whether you need to back off or um, with the elephants walking straight past you, they are very relaxed and happy they're coming to you so uh, you typically don't get any uh, adverse incidents with the with the elephants in those circumstances great and there's a question here from melissa de mayo melissa would like to know um, are animals able to cross the public roads like the r335 and the r342 that traverse the park um, are there any bridges or tunnels for animals to move across or do the roads confine the animals to specific areas? So unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, the different sections of Addo as it stands are quite um, subdivided. Uh, there is one major road that goes right through the center of the park at south of the R335. I forget what it is, uh, what the name is but the elephants, lions, everything like that are able to cross that quite freely. But the core elephant area and the Nyati area to the north are um, separate. They are both fenced apart from each other, but there are efforts to try and um, connect it all in the future and to have it as one uh, large uh, area that the animals can uh, roam through quite freely. Thanks, Dan. Uh, a quick question here. How do you separate out the Siberian race of the peregrine falcon to the, the regular one that we get here? So there are some uh, fairly minor plumage differences, um, but the Siberian race of peregrine falcon is noticeably larger than our um, resident breeding race. Um, they all are also quite different in their behavior where the uh, resident birds do tend to stay quite close to the cliffs. The Siberian race, you can pretty much see them anywhere. Um, so a combination of large size, some small plumage differences, and then uh, behavioral differences, seeing them away from the cliffs that the peregrines nest on. Great. Thanks, Dan, for clearing that up. Uh, Freddy Janssen from the Rendsburg would like to know the red bull oxpeckers, were they reintroduced or were they present all the time in Addo? Absolutely. So the, uh, the Eastern Cape has, uh, over the course of history, been an incredibly important agricultural uh, region of South Africa. And with the beef herds that uh, came to the Eastern Cape, so too came um, oxpecker um, or, or dips and uh, chemical treatment for ticks and things that uh, affect the cattle. So uh, red-billed oxpecker were virtually eradicated from the uh, Eastern Cape as a result, but there's ongoing efforts to try and reintroduce them. And uh, the red-billed oxpecker is now fairly common in Addo, as well as several of the surrounding uh, reserves. I believe that that um, reintroduction program happened about 10 years ago. So the birds have had time to multiply and now they are quite common again. 
Yeah, that's a great uh, story to be told from a, a reintroduction in conservation. Absolutely. They are important uh, service providers to the ungulates in terms of removing all those ectoparasites. So it's great to see them back. Absolutely. Uh, Janet Ed, you've asked where anyone can access this uh, excellent talk and the recording thereof. So just to answer your question, uh, our YouTube channel, if you search BirdLife South Africa on YouTube, has all uh, now 50 of our episodes uh, recorded and uh, stored on our YouTube channel. So you can go and watch every single Conservation Conversation episode from number one to number 50 on, on our YouTube channel. So we've done quite a few features on these different sandfox reserves and uh, each of them is uh, definitely worth revisiting before you you go ahead and uh, book your next trip to to one of these sand fox national parks and this one is a uh, is uh, no uh, exception to that uh, Dan you did a great job thank you um, David Reed would like to know well he, he says rather that it's fascinating fascinating to understand how dung beetles navigate to find their way uh, would this be different for the flightless dung beetle, uh, which is, of course, endemic to the region? Um, I believe that the, I have to admit that I don't know as much as I would like about insects, uh, but I believe the, uh, the dung, that particular dung beetle finds its way through very similar means to uh, the other species found through the rest of Africa. The way that it does differ is that uh, with the flightlessness obviously comes the lack of wings and in the space that the wings should be, the dung beetles have evolved a uh, extremely unique uh, method of storing carbon dioxide as a way to um, survive within these um, incredibly sort of dry and arid regions. So they've got a unique carbon storing mechanism in place of the wings, which I found quite fascinating. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, I know that uh, there is a, a famous paper, I think it was published in uh, the journal Nature, the very famous journal uh, by Marcus Byrne here at Witts University in Johannesburg on how dung beetles use uh, the cosmos, the, the Milky Way and other constellations mm. in the sky to, to navigate, which I've at night or obviously, um, but I found that absolutely fascinating. I mean, the, the fact that these small little, you know, um, not very imposing uh, beetles, as, as charismatic as they can be, uh, at night are, are reading the sky to, to see where they go is, is quite incredible, I think. Absolutely. And something I also found quite interesting about the Addo flightless dung beetle is it's unique among dung beetles and that the male does very little work towards reproduction. So the female creates the dung ball um, and the male sort of follows her around at an appropriate distance until it's his moment and uh, he runs in, does his thing and gets out as quick as possible. The female does the rest. Uh, so behaviorally, this is also a fairly unique species among the rest of the dung beetles. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, all right, Andre Geldenhuis has a question here. He, he wants to know, you, you mentioned a whole lot of uh, thicket specials in terms of the birds that are available. Absolutely. Other than patience, is there any other suggestion you have of finding these birds in the, in the thicket? The thicket, obviously, as the name suggests, is an incredibly dense habitat. So I would say the most important thing is to know the calls um, and then to get out early, as early as possible into the thicket when both birds are most vocally active. Uh, given the density of the vegetation, a lot of the uh, birds that live within the Albany thicket have very loud and prominent calls. Uh, so if you can get there when the birds are most vocally active and you know the calls, uh, it is very possible to, uh, to find all of the specials. Thanks for sharing that. I know it can be uh, absolutely frustrating to, to <laughs> especially for species like um, for Nisner Warbler in particular. To yeah. be standing there by the thicket, you can hear the bird calling not two meters away from you and it is absolutely invisible. 
You cannot. Absolutely. <laughs> and in that case, Southern, yeah, yeah, that. Southern Chagra is not much better. <laughs> yeah, it can be a real bugger to try and see. So in those cases, um, you can use the call to get as close as possible and then just stick it out and uh, wait for patience it to show itself. Patience is a virtue, certainly. And yeah. often if you just sit quietly and wait, uh, Addo being a big five reserve, you're not allowed out of your vehicle, but a vehicle is the best bird hide and that you can move it into the position that you want. And if you hear a bird calling and you just sit and wait, often these birds will em emerge out of the vegetation to feed in slightly open, more open areas on the, on the side. Southern Chagra, for example, is frequently seen feeding on the ground. Um, so if you just sit patiently, you know the birds around, sit and wait, chances are good that you will actually see the bird. Mm. Great, thanks for those tips. So Alistair Stalker would like to know, uh, we've talked about how important the spec worm uh, thickets are for carbon sequestration. Are we concerned at all about thicket degradation in Addo National Park? So this is a very interesting debate, and unfortunately, you can debate this either way. Uh, but the debate exists that as the Addo elephant population has increased, so we've seen changes to the thicket vegetation within Addo Elephant National Park. So to use the iconic species Addo ferox, for example, um, when Addo was first proclaimed in 1931, Allo ferox was very common throughout the park and you could see it just about everywhere. Now that the elephant population has increased so substantially, Allo ferox has retreated into sites that aren't necessarily uh, accessible to the elephants. So uh, in rocky copies, for example, or uh, on, in areas with a very steep gradient. So the argument exists, is this a natural reversion to an ecological state that existed before the decimation of the elephant population, or are the elephants actually having a negative influence on the population? And it's food for thought, you could argue it either which way, but it is a uh, very current and um, quite profound uh, argument that exists um, relating to Addo. I think uh, elephant management across all the sandbox reserves that have elephants is a, is a controversial and uh, very loaded topic. Uh, elephants, absolutely. everyone loves having elephants, but they, they can cause environmental degradation. But as you say, there is an argument to be made that they are in fact maintaining the proper ecological process. Absolutely. And elephants are very much a keystone species. Um, as a side note, then, I do remember some time back talking to a botanist who worked extensively on aloe ferox, and she had, date, or she had aged many of the aloe ferox within Addo and found that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the aloes that you see in Addo actually post-date the hunting of elephants. So with the elephant population declining, so the, addo, so the aloes had time uh, and opportunity to uh, spread throughout the park. And now that the elephants are there, the, uh, the aloes are obviously the first to go, given they're so nutritious and uh, full of moisture. Um, is, is it a reversion to the natural state or are elephants really causing an ecological disaster? You can, you can argue it either which way. I think there's some interesting work to be done here, potentially by the, the UCT Paleoecological Lab, and looking at how uh, common the, the different plant compositions were uh, pre, you know, in, in prehistoric times leading into elephant populations and then after in, in more recent times after they were um, exterminated or virtually exterminated. I think maybe there's a study there that I need to get Lindsay Gilson on too. But let, let's, Absolutely. let's move on. Uh, we've just yeah. got a couple of minutes left and I, I hope you are making a note of some of the better questions that have come your way. Uh, I'm going to give you one from Graham Ebedis here. Graham, I hope I didn't uh, butcher your surname too much. 
Graham would like to know, in a closed environment such as Addo, how is inbreeding of species managed? I know you, you've mentioned elephants, but perhaps you'd like to expand a bit. Uh, so I certainly don't think in terms of the rest of the herbivores that Addo has reached carrying capacity. Um, I know in terms of some of the predators, there is a predator rotation program in which uh, with the lion, for example, there's about 12 lion in the core section of Addo. They bring in males from elsewhere, basically swap out a male every so often to reintroduce new genetics to ensure that there isn't any genetic depletion. Uh, with the elephants, the genetic diversity was in obviously incredibly depleted when it got down to uh, just 11 individuals within the same core family group. So there have been efforts uh, throughout the evolution of uh, Addo into what Addo is today to reintroduce elephant genetics back into the population. Uh, and one of the ones they're working on at the moment, now that the population has increased to uh, normal levels again, is to try, try and reintroduce those tusked genes back into the population. Great. All right, Dan, it's uh, looking at my watch here, about two minutes to our cutoff at half past eight. I'm going to give you a chance now to just consider which two questions you, you found the most interesting, the most left field, the most whatever your criteria are. And uh, then if you can announce who they were um, and we can get in touch with them to get them their special prizes tonight. And of course, while Dan is uh, looking through all the questions and you can look at the answer tab as well as the unanswered questions if you'd like, Dan, just make sure they are South African citizens and have provided contact details. If you are not the winner of one of our two copies tonight, of course, there were over 450 of you tuned in and we only have two copies and a lot of questions to get through. Uh, you can order your Shaping Arrow book at a specially discounted rate, especially for this webinar. So thank you to Straight Nature Publishers for doing this for us. Uh, that link is in the chat box and it has been on our rolling slides as well. You're welcome to, to email me or uh, info at, birding, at birdlife.org.za if you want to get that link from us if you missed it earlier. That is available at 256 Rand, which is discounted from 320 Rand. And as a bonus, you will get free delivery. So please, uh, if you did enjoy tonight's webinar, do go ahead and order a copy of Shaping Addo by Mitch Reardon. Um, and again, thank you to Strake for making these two copies available to us, as well as this discounted offer that we can offer our audience tonight on our 50th birthday. Dan, have you reached any conclusions? I've reached one conclusion. Um, the other I'm going to need to... Uh have your help with because I can't seem to find the comment. Uh, but I particularly enjoyed and I did sort of touch on it. I hope that um, I did answer. It's a question posed by Lorna Ellis as to how many different sounds elephants make and what, the, uh, what type of defense mechanism they use. Uh, and elephants are obviously incredibly social creatures and they're uh, they're known to make hundreds of different sounds and there's lots of individual variation in sounds. Um, there's a lot of studies being done on elephant communication. So, well, I don't think we have all of the answers per se. Um, elephant communication really is uh, an incredibly interesting topic. So um, I think Lorna Ellis from is in Quasi Bird Club, uh, which I believe is one of the South African branches. Yes, it's Not here sure in the where that is. Perfect. And then the other one will be just because I'm a sucker for seabirds, uh, <laughs> whoever asked the Australasian gannet question, I can't seem to find that question. I'll, I'll um, find it for you shortly. Um, it's uh, Ted van der Meulen. Uh, and he's on Sea Point in Cape Town. So, so well done to Lorna and to Ted. Uh, well done for asking some uh, great questions. You picked on Daniel's soft spots. You identified them early. Well done. And uh, thanks to him for picking out our winners tonight. No pressure. 
<laughs> well, thank you to everyone else who asked questions. It, uh, I hope I asked, answered them satisfactorily. And um, yeah, it was wonderful chatting this evening. Yeah, and thank you uh, again from me to everyone who, who tuned in tonight. Uh, 50 episodes is a massive achievement and we would not have been able to do it without all of your support. We're absolutely blown away by how many people keep tuning in week after week, uh, over a year into it now. Uh, we've been bringing you these webinars, but we still have an audience. And as long as we have an audience, we will keep bringing you exciting speakers and destinations and content uh, for you to enjoy and to learn from. Um, and then lastly, just thank you so much, Dan. Um, I knew you were going to be a hit. We had uh, a really, really good attendance tonight. I think that's a testament to uh, the exciting destination, but also people are very excited to hear from you. Uh, you did a fantastic job. And uh, thank you so much for joining Conservation Conversations. Thank you, Andrew.